So let me, with that, introduce the first speaker. Dr. Andrew Duggins is uh, a staff neurological expert, a neurology expert at the Westmead Hospital. His, uh, his talk is entitled Beauty in the Eye of the Beholder, the Relativity of Visual Experience. Um, having flicked through some of the presentations as I said earlier, we're, we're throwing you in the deep end here with this one um, because it's probably the most technical one. So if you're, good, if you're really awake, you've had your coffee, and you're gonna, you need to, we're going to beat you into submission with this one, maybe. But having said that, um, you know after that we're going to we're going to um, make you relax with some cake and uh, morning tea, and then Ajahn Brahm, who's just arrived, will massage your minds with with the perspective of a Buddhist monk after that. So you've got to do some hard work, but you're going to be looked after as well. Um, Andrew Duggins is a practicing clinical neurologist in Western Sydney, uh, with clinical interest in dementia and stroke but also a theoretical neuroscientist of consciousness, uh, where he got his PhD. He worked as a staff specialist at, at Westmead Hospital, where he runs a cognition clinic. He was awarded a, a PhD in theoretical neuroscience from Uni University College London in 2009 for his dissertation, The Form of Consciousness, right in the middle of what we're talking about here. He has more recently explored the potential for differential geometry and information theory, and we'll probably learn if that's, that's the hard bit, um, to advance our understanding of consciousness, particularly the distortions of spatial and temporal experience, another difficult bit, that characterize particular clinical ne uh, neurological orders. He's widely published in this area, and uh, I noticed also in 2013 he also spoke, also spoke on this subject for the AIP in New York, but that's the American Institute of Physics. Uh, it's a tradition that before I introduce people, I uh, tell them what their name means, and uh, Andrew's one that we've done many times before, and it means manly or courageous. So with that, Andrew, over to you. Well, I don't know about manly, but uh, it is a somewhat daunting experience as a clinical neurologist to speak about relativity to a group of, I assume, largely physicists. But anyway, I, I like the challenge. Um, and, and actually, look, I don't think it's going to be quite as tough as, as Scott's made it sound, because what I'm going to try and present to you is basically how someone without any physics background after high school has tried to make some sense, in this case, about relativity. I should just um, throw in a bit of an apology here. Those of you who read uh, Scott's piece might be thinking I'm going to be talking about microtubules and quantum mechanics. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but just to, in order to have some balance in the program, I decided to talk about something new, really, which is, uh, in, in this case, um, well, something really I've only been thinking about for six months, but whether another major, major area of 20th century physics, relativity, both special and general, might be helpful in some way uh, in describing experience. So, let's move on. And most of you would, would say, yeah, experience is relative, but I'm going to uh, try to argue uh, the, something that perhaps seems a little more extreme. Do the transformation of Einstein's special relativity, and don't get too worried about that, because I'm going to try and explain geographically what these are. Do they also apply to subjective space-time, or if that um, term worries you, just put in space and time. Okay, and subjective, in other words, what I experience, not what you can measure. And so that's going to be the first half of my talk, but the second half really is going to be argue, arguing for this thesis, in a sense, um, which is, uh, is even more contentious. <laughs> so which is really just as Gravity is the curvature of objective space-time by a mass. I'm going to be trying to convince you that perhaps attention is the curvature of subjective space-time by information. So there's a challenge. I've got half an hour, I think, to cover special relativity, general relativity, and information theory. So let's, let's go, go for it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, well, what do I mean by this concept of uh, subjective space-time. I'm going to try and, for those of you who uh, haven't, uh, it's been a while since you've done your undergraduate physics, I'll try to just give you my understanding of special relativity. 
and of course to try to uh, describe how that uh, might relate to neuroscience. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about information theory and in particular how this concept of efficient encoding might relate to the brain and the encoding that, that our brains do all the time. Uh, and then using you know, what understanding we might have gained from information theory, try and bring in this, this uh, thesis I just showed you, talking about things from, um, well, from varying disciplines like oddball effects in uh, the, the neuroscientific experimental literature the artist's perspective, um, the, the, and then coming in with some areas from general relativity you might have heard of, the equivalence principle, and then because I'm a clinical neurologist, a little bit of clinical neurology describing a neurologic syndrome in bizarrely relativistic terms, which is visual inattention. Okay, so probably not too many of you took the train today, two kilometers away, I, I, was, uh, I think. But this is, uh, this is how Einstein um, conceived of special relativity. So um, we're looking at, um, we'll call him Bert here, um, from the back of his head as he stands on one platform, and we've got this sort of see-through clock. So we're looking at this clock from the back, and we're looking at the back of the sign here on this platform, across at the other platform. And why, why he's got a clock is that uh, his colleague, we'll call him Al, also has a clock and is on a train. And the question of special relativity is uh, how long does a tick of the clock on the train take relative to the click of the clock on the platform? Here we go. So that was, we'll call it Al uh, rushing past uh, and uh, with his, with his clock. Um, so uh, the, the theorems of, of, of well, a bit over what, 110 years ago um, of special relativity basically showed that uh, the moving clock, one, one tick, one second of the moving clock, uh, lasts longer than a second for the for Bert here on the platform uh, with, with, with the station clock. Although, of course, uh, it's perfectly acceptable also to take the inertial reference frame, as it's called, of being off the train and looking at the platform. But what I'm just going to try to suggest to you is, rather than standing back and looking at both Bert here and Al, I think it's probably equally reasonable to climb inside Bert's head here and imagine that rather than that being a depiction of objective space and time. And instead, now what I'm trying to show you is what Bert on that platform is experiencing. And, and this is just a snapshot in, of, of things which would be simultaneous in time for Bert. But of course, you can, you can also, uh, with a little bit of sort of conceptualizing, think of, of that subjective space also extending in time. Um, and here we get the same thing. You might not be surprised to see that it's exactly the same. Okay. And really what I'm going to be trying to suggest to you is that perhaps, perhaps some of the same transformations that apply to objective space and time in Einstein's relativity also occur in the subjective experience of space and time. And before you start thinking, come on please, the starting point here is there is a wealth of neuroscientific experiment, uh, experimental data to show that uh, a stimulus which is moving through your visual field, the stimulus, for example, that lasts one second, you experience to last longer than a second. And moreover, the faster it's moving, the, the longer that, that second seems to dilate. Okay. So there's a starting point. So we have some, some neuroscientific data, and we have a, a formal, a theoretical structure from uh, objective space and time which works. Can we apply it? So this is just to show you, can, you can do it the other way, and imagine uh, now this, the boundary is supposed to indicate you know, this is from Al's perspective, looking out, now looking, before we were looking east, now this is Al looking, looking west, um, and watching things go by through that window. 
and then you'll see the platform and branching, and then, oh, there you go, Bert on the platform. It took me a while to do um, so, uh, so what I'm go just going to give you a, a basically a my graphical understanding. I'm, I'm trying my very best to avoid any formulas here. My graphical understanding of special relativity, and I, for the first few slides, I'm going to present it as I think you might have seen it in, in your undergraduate physics days. But I'm going to later suggest that all of this could conceivably apply also to that subjective space and mode. So, so usually what you would do is uh, imagine just one dimension. We could, we could make it three dimensions of space, but we'll just start with one dimension of space and one dimension of time. You can think of it if you like. It's that dimension extending along that platform, for example. And this will, this will we'll say it's the, the inertial reference frame corresponding to Bert that is standing on, on the platform time here. And then you can, of course, uh, imagine in this reference frame um, lines of simultaneity um, extending out, you know, and we'll say that's one second there, and these are fractions of a second. And similarly, uh, you can imagine creating a grid in which, uh, in, in which particular positions extending through time uh, are indicated like that. Nothing that amazing about that. And then, of course, just, just so you can get your head around what velocities or speeds, I guess, would would look like, well, that would be a slow speed or a faster speed in this reference frame. In other words, distance increasing with time. Okay. Um, and it, so now, if we were to take the classical view of, well, how would you show both uh, Bert's reference frame and also Al's reference frame, well, a classical perspective would be something like this, that we could also come up with a similar grid system here for uh, Al, as we did for Bert, but that basically the, the lines of simultaneity are the same, in this case, the one second line, for example. And uh, this all looks you know, pretty reasonable. Until we decide, well, we're going to choose units here, so uh, one second and one here on the distance axis. We're going to choose these units so that from Bert's perspective, the speed of light is one. But the problem that Einstein had with this, of course, is that the speed of light now is not one, but how? I have to show you that. So if we, if we sort of now depict this um, so that we're in Al's reference frame, all I've done is switch everything around, but, but now, obviously, the speed of light is not equal to one. So, look, I mean, the Einstein's theory of, rel of special relativity is, I'm not trying to belittle it in any way, but really, what Einstein did was start with this picture and say, well, how could we make this so that the speed of light is one, not only for Bert, but also for Al? And any of you who can sort of uh, do a PowerPoint diagram can see how to do that. Well, let's just tilt that up a bit. And now suddenly, we, we have basically a speed of light, which is one for both Al and Bert. Um, there's one problem with this diagram still, which is that if you look at it, one of, of Bert's seconds here still corresponds to one second here for Al. But it's not a reciprocal arrangement because see, we've got uh, some sort of time dilation when the other way around when Al is looking at Bert. So uh, this would be not reciprocal. So then the only other thing you have to do to, to make things truly relativistic between the two is stretch it all up a little bit in your diagram so that now basically um, one of the seconds on Al's clock takes more than a second on Bert's clock. But also, you could have done it the other way around, so, so there's a, a completely reciprocal arrangement. And while I won't be talking as much about this, you can also, of course, think of length contraction, so that um, some sort of measuring rod, which is as long as a, a light second, is actually shorter than a light second for Bert. 
So there we go. That's special relativity in five minutes. Uh, the only other thing I would just uh, throw in here, and that you can switch off of this bit if you like, but what, um, what uh, actually Minkowski worked out a couple of years after the first paper on relativity is that it, what is this degree of stretch that we had to throw in here to make this reciprocal? You know, I just sort of created that to make it look nice on the diagram. But is there a mathematical way of looking at that? Interestingly, always you will find that you have to stretch this out just enough so that this point lies on this hyperbola. T squared minus x squared equals 1. Okay, and I'll say, well, so what? Um, you could then you know, do what we did before in terms of that now looking at things from Hal's perspective and now Bert's one second is now also on that hyperbola. Um, but what's interesting is that this then gives you a, a formal metric, if you like, of, of distance in space-time. Let me try and show you. So you can imagine um, you get that point relative to the origin. Now, clearly, for Al here, who's the, the red, that we've got here in terms of t squared minus x squared, that's just t squared, which is 1. But also, of course, because we're on this hyperbola, it's also one for both. So in other words, this quantity of t squared minus x squared seems to be conserved in all of these different inertial preference rates. Um, and so you, this gives you this concept of something like proper time, which will I'll indicate as four here, which would be the same anywhere along that hyperbola. Um, and so that there's the definition. Okay. So, so I've, I've kind of rushed through special relativity there. And you might be saying at this point, oh yes, yeah, I remember something about that from undergraduate physics. But what the hell has this got to do with physics of the mind? And in particular, when I first started trying to talk, to this, talk about this to physicists, they said, yeah, but this all depends on this thing about the speed of light being the same in all different reference frames. And, and what, what's your speed of light in subjective space and time? And, and what, what is subjective speed anyway? And, and uh, that's the that thing which has really troubled me with this. Because, to be honest, there's very little data out there about just what is, um, is a subjective speed. A lot, there's a lot more data about what is subjective duration. I mentioned some of that before. So let me just... Um, uh, mention something which I think gives, helps us to a possible answer. Here's uh, Al again. But now imagine Al, as he's rushing past, has got a gun there, and he now shoots a bullet in the direction in which, in which he's, he didn't really stop. He, he, he was going the whole time. But, but basically, I'm just so you can see the bullet. And, uh, and so what, the reason I'm doing this is yeah, so we can think of Al moving relative to Bert, and we can think of the bullet moving relative to Al. But is there an is there an easy way of describing the movement of the bullet relative to Bert on, on here on the platform? And um, and that's where some of the weirdness comes into special relativity. So here I've just tried up with the same diagram to show pink here is the is the bullet, and it's, so it's it's all sort of twisted even more. Um, and when, how you, you, you start getting an idea of that is if instead of talking about um, about just time and distance, if, if instead uh, we talk about speeds. Okay. So here I'm going to plot on the on the y-axis speed where where that green line corresponds to the speed of light being one. And there's there's this concept in special relativity of something called rapidity interesting word. Um, so we're going to, um, I'm going to show you here, this is still um, conventional special relativity where I'm going to plot rapidity against speed. So rapidity is defined as uh, in this way, and you don't need to really understand what a hyperbolic tangent is, but that's the rapidity and that's, that's speed. Anyway, so let me try and plot here the things that we've talked about. So on that diagram, uh, the the speed of Al 
relative to birth was about half of the speed of light. Okay. And, and in fact, then, the, the speed of the bullet relative to Al uh, was about a quarter of the speed of light. So you would think that if I were to ask you, well, how fast is uh, the bullet going relative to birth, you would think it, it would be, well, you know, half as fast again, or in other words, three quarters of the speed of light. But to get, you know, half as fast again, you can only do that actually with rapidity. In fact, this would be the speed of the bullet relative to birth, which is not 0.75, it's a little less. So in other words, the point of this rapidity is it's additive, whereas the speeds are not. But rapidity, in a sense, is a virtual concept. Things actually you know, move with speeds, not with rapidity. But rapidity gives you this, this uh, capacity to add up. Okay? And this gives is one way of looking at why it's possible to accelerate beyond the speed of light. Because these things don't continue to add up, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and you asymptote to what the speed of light. Okay, whereas on this axis you would keep on adding up to infinity. Okay. So here's where I where I will try to bring in uh, this concept. Well what is a subjective speed? Okay. And now I'm going to take this huge leap it was already challenging enough for me to give you special relativity in 10 minutes. Now I'm going to teach you some clinical neurology, okay? And it, which I think is a handle on, well, what is subjective speed? And this is something called the vestibulo-ocular reflex. I apologize for the somewhat demonic uh, uh, animation, but I, it, it wasn't supposed to be bags under the eyes, but it just came out that way. But anyway, the vestibulo-ocular reflex is the compensatory movement that your eyes make for head movement to maintain fixation of, of something in your visual environment on your retina. And it looks something like this. You imagine that, um, I do this to my patients, by the way, that you get the head and you start wobbling it one way or the other, and you look at what happens to the eyes. Here we go. So, so you see that basically the eyes keep looking in the same direction. Uh, even as you're, uh, you're turning the head. And you might say, well, what, what does that have to do with su subjective speed? Well, the interesting thing is that that reflex is independent of vision. You get the same vestibulo-ocular reflex in complete darkness as you get uh, in the light. In other words, you're not making the compensatory eye movement based on, based on the visual but rather on the vestibular input, which is the, the mechanism in your inner ear with which you, you, um, uh, you record and experience angular uh, accelerations. Even more interesting, really, is that you get the same thing if you just basically stimulate the vestibular apparatus on one side, classically uh, with caloric stimulation, uh, so with, with warm water in one ear. Some of you might have had this done, not a pleasant sensation. But basically it gives you the experience of uh, angular acceleration in the opposite direction, so squirt from the left ear. The other thing, that it, it looks something like this. So this is with the head still squirting in the left ear, the eyes tend to drip to the right and then jerk back. Okay. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you, and this is pure hypothesis, I'm going to suggest to you, this person who's getting caloric stimulation in the left ear, not only do their eyes drip to the right, but they experience vertigo. They experience the sense of angular, uh, angular acceleration. Uh, and I guess anchor acceleration, they actually experience that it, it's thought by, um, by basically integrating acceleration to get velocity, they, that they experience the head spinning. That's what, that's what vertigo is. And what I'm going to suggest to you is it would be a very strange thing, perhaps it's true, but it would be a very strange thing if the speed with which the eyes drift to the right is different from the speed that you experience your head moving in the 
And so I'm going to say, without knowing whether it's true, let's just hypothesize that subjective velocity, or subjective speed, corresponds to that speed of the slow phase of the nystagmus. Uh, again, you'll probably say, but hold on, you're talking about turning the head and, and experiencing speed. Obviously, it's a different thing from experiencing speed with the head still in your visual environment. But, um, but what if it's the same? Again, these are open neuroscientific questions. Um, much of what I'm actually going to say to you here about the vestibular reflex, though, at least in terms of limiting speeds, does seem to also apply to pursuit high movements, which is with the head still. Anyway, so this is the classic paper looking at, well, what about eye velocity against head velocity? Um, and that's with the uh, with lights on, and this is in complete darkness. And the interesting thing, um, the, these authors of, of um, of course, didn't express this in relativistic terms, but there seems to be a limiting speed um, at about 500 degrees per second. This is the speed of the, which the eyes, the angular uh, velocity, I guess we can say, of the eyes relative to the head velocity. And if you just impose that same curve that I imposed before, it fits pretty well. Uh, in fact, the only place it doesn't seem to fit is down here, but that's, that's actually just because the eyes are not centered in the center of the head. So you need to have a, a slightly greater angular velocity of the eye relative to the head. Um, but apart from that, it fits pretty well. So in other words, there's been, there's been many different you know, leaps that I've made in the course of the last 10, 15 minutes. But in a sense, we do seem, at least conceivably, to have a limiting speed of subjective uh, speed. And we also have a result in terms of time dilation of increasing speeds, um, which is, I don't think, disputed in the neuroscientific literature. So, at least conceivably, and this is as far as I can get with this, uh, the transformations of Einstein's special relativity perhaps do apply to subjective space and time. So, perhaps. How am I going to stop it? 10 minutes? Okay. I'm just going to keep going. I'm sure that I've uh, outraged half of the audience already, but we'll, well, we'll, we'll keep going. So now, information theory in five minutes. Okay, so just imagine we've got a, a number of colored shapes in a hat, and we're going to generate a sequence by sampling uh, these with replacements, and we're just going to write down the sequence. It's going to look something like this, perhaps. And then I asked you, well, how are you going to go about encoding that sequence? Well, you might say, well, there are four different colored shapes. Let's use two binary digits for each, something like that. And then we get a code that looks something like that. Again, I'm outraging the computer scientists here, I'm sure. And of course, you will find that you've used two binary digits per trial to encode the sequence. Okay. But that those of you who are a little switched on or have done some information theory will think, ah, you can do better. And how you do better is you notice in, in our hat here that the proportions of the color shapes are not the same. That, uh, which way is it? So the, the blue squares are, are more prevalent than the, what, the blue circles and the red squares. So in fact, those are the and so you might say, well, why don't we use a shorter code word for the things which are more likely to occur? That would be smart. Perhaps something like this, one binary digit for something which is likely and three for something which is unlikely. Why did I choose that? Well, this is just this definition as a log curve. I think I said probably I wasn't going to use um, formulas. But basically information is just d described as a minus log curve. With that diagram, this being this distance here being the information, for example, two bits corresponding to a quarter or one bit to a half. So, what if we? And then this is basically just the Morse code kind of idea. The things with letters which occur commonly, like E, you have a short code relative to something like I don't know a Y or something like that. So here we get here we've got a, a, a different type of code where we, where we've got a number of binary digits corresponding to the number of bits. And we'd see, do we do any better? Uh, you can go through that if you like, but I think I got that right. 
And the answer is yes, you do. In fact, now it's only taking you 1.75 binary digits per trial. And some of you say, yeah, but why did I come up with, uh, with this definition of, of bits? Well, this is basically all down to Claude Shannon, who in 1948 uh, proved mathematically that this is the optimal coding efficiency. You cannot do better in a long, uh, in a, a long sequence uh, than uh, 1.75 bits per trial, the, the average of that information. So there's information theory. Um, now, again, I'm going to suggest that, um, that this has got a lot to do with neuroscience. In fact, back in the 1950s, there, there was a lot less taboo about it, applying maths and physics to neuroscience than there is now. Um, so, in a choice reaction type task, which means you're given four alternatives and a coloured shape appears, something like that, and you have to press a button for whichever one it was, um, it was only four or five years after Shannon described information theory, it was shown that basically reaction time depends on information, proportional to information. Um, so, in other words, we have quicker reactions and more probable alternatives which gives us, because of Shannon's theorem, the minimal reaction time on average. Uh, but that, surprisingly, I think this happens a lot in neuroscience. That has just been sort of forgotten. You know, nobody worries about that anymore in neuroscience. But I think it's really important. I mean, this is why when you've got four different predators which might go for you, you need to predict which one's going to go first. It's important that you, you predict right. Okay. So survival depends on having minimum average reaction time. So th this is my way of looking at it anyway. And uh, so reaction time depends on the length of the neural code. Really. And I was involved um, 10 years ago now in a, a functional imaging experiment, basically looking at those same, um, those same kind of experiments but in an fMRI scanner, where we just thought, well, let's look at the length of the neural code work in terms of how, how much activity of the brain do we get. Uh, so this was the, the, um, the behavioral data from the same experiment. We got the same result that um, Hick and Hyman had got, 129 milliseconds per bit of entropy. But interestingly, there's this 50 milliseconds per bit of self-information reaction time. And remember that, 50 milliseconds. And, and actually, virtually all the bits of the brain which would be uh, described as uh, being involved in encoding uh, a, a visual stimulus, that activity in those areas varied with the information of the stimulus. Okay. That's what I'm showing you here. This is how you would typically um, display this. And, and the interesting part about that is that that is in the, generally described as the visual attention network of the brain. Um, and, and most people don't do the, the experiments within a sort of information theoretic manner. So then instead, that you would talk about oddball you know, responses causing more brain activity. But oddballs basically are things which are unlikely to occur. When they do occur, cause more brain activity. I won't go into repetition suppression. It, it also suggests some interesting stuff, which I don't know whether any of the other speakers are going to um, uh, come back to on the, on the neural code. But that's not my topic today. But I'm supposed to be talking more about the mind, and after uh, we did that functional imaging experiment, people started looking at subjective duration. How long do things last? Very much like the, what I was uh, talking to you about before with speeds. But this is uh, dependent on predictability. Um, and uh, I'll just sort of uh, quickly skim through this, but basically what you do is you this is um, David Eagleman's uh, series of papers and work. But basically, you would present a series of stimuli, which are shown here. Um, and then you would actually vary the duration of the first stimulus relative to the second. And then ask people subsequently to uh, decide whether on a particular trial the first stimulus was longer or shorter than the second stimulus, which was always 500 milliseconds. Um, and the interesting thing about these uh, experiments, and there's, there's a large series of them, is that basically uh, 
and how long you think the stimulus lasted depended on, and in this case, how long you think the second stimulus lasted, because the first stimulus is always the same, seems to depend on its predictability. And if you put it in terms of bits, you find that it's about an extra, your subjective experience of duration seems to vary by about 40 milliseconds per bit. If something carries an extra bit of information, it seems to last about 40 milliseconds longer. I won't go into this one, but it's the same, same result. Uh, again, about 40 milliseconds per bit. Remembering that reaction time seems to vary by about 50 milliseconds per bit. Okay? So, the interesting thing about information in neuroscience is inform subjective, uh, stimulus information seems to expand subjective duration but also reaction latency to about the same extent. So there's information theory in the brain. I'm already over time. Can I have five minutes for general relativity? <laughs> uh, so this is uh, something about that, about the neural code word in a sense that the, the, the brain is acting a little bit like a zombie. And whereas the experience is the, the thing that the, the zombie's got on her head and she plays celebrity here. And the brain has to ask, am I a blue circle? And has to keep on asking questions. Uh, only finally gets the result, even though she's had the experience of the red square all along. That's inside. <laughs> okay, I think I've said all of this. Um, we've talked maybe about the hard problem. But let's just think about the, the, the entrance to general relativity and curvature of space-time just comes out of this sort of question. Well, if everything I'm experiencing is varying in duration, dependent on how predictable it is, why isn't my experience a total mess? Okay. Imagine listening to a symphony uh, when there's suddenly a discordant uh, you know, note or when suddenly there's an entry of an instrument you didn't expect. Does that completely put off the meter? Does everything then get out of time? Well, of course it doesn't. So in other words, somehow we are able to assess durations as varying even though we maintain simultaneity of onsets and offsets of different stimuli in our experience. So that, that's kind of interesting because really as far as I know, maybe someone can tell me afterwards if they've got another explanation. The only way that's possible is if in some sense parts of your experience are curved relative to others. And this is just a, a, a heuristic the idea if you had three stimuli here, well, this would be a zero bit, something that you knew was certain was going to happen, then just say it actually lasted 320 milliseconds, well, then it, you would experience it at 320 milliseconds. But if it carried a bit of information, as I said, it would expand in your experience by 40 milliseconds, two bits to 400 milliseconds. So is there some sort of curvature of uh, my uh, subjective experience. And uh, again, this is heuristic. I'll try and uh, uh, show you a little bit more formally how you might uh, look at this. Something like this, where again, we've, I've used the same colors. This, this being a, a less predictable stimulus, green here an objective, and which causes more curvature of space and time. Um, and this was my theorem, which I'm going to try in um, just a moment to explain to you. And to do this, really, I have to just try and explain in the concept that might be a little bit more familiar to you, um, this idea of curvature. Okay, this is the delivery of the keys. Anyone who's been to the Sistine Chapel might have seen this. Um, and it was one of the, uh, it's by Perugino, it's one of the classic early Renaissance works to introduce perspective, where basically all these lines uh, are uh, focusing on a vanishing point at the, at the horizon. And I want you to imagine yourself standing on a, in the middle of a road on a plane looking at the distance. So then this idea of the artist's perspective is that, that you would draw uh, parallel lines, objectively parallel lines, as straight lines converging on that point at the horizon. But uh, actually, for me, this doesn't entirely work. Because if I imagine actually standing in the middle of that road, not only do I see the other sides of the road converging in front of me, but I imagine the, uh, the sides of the road converging to a point at 
behind me as well. Okay. And what I'm going to describe is to try to describe that subjective space, which I suggest to you that it's actually curved. So I'm going to suggest to you that the, the experience of a person standing in the middle of a road could be mapped without distortion of angles or subjective distances onto a curved surface like this sphere. Um, and basically why I'm introducing this is that this is kind of what you do in general relativity. You have a flat space with a coordinate system which you try and impose on a curved surface. And it works for a small region up here, but it becomes less and less successful uh, the further you, you move away. So this is, um, this, instead of just having a coordinate system, we actually have the road there and the, the person standing in the middle of the road and you imagine points which are about equidistant uh, along the edge of the road there, and you imagine projecting them onto that sphere, which I'm going to suggest is this person's subjective experience of distance. You'll find that the points which are further away tend to be squashed up on the sphere, whereas the points which are closer tend to be spread out more. Or you could say that the, uh, a particular displacement here on the sphere uh, is dilated uh, if, the, if those points are further away than if they would be here. And at infinity, you find that it comes to zero. So, so basically, what I'm going to try to suggest to you is that this curve here of the two edges of the road corresponds, I think, to this person's experience. So this is not a conventional way of describing the artist's perspective, but it is a way that I think introduces this concept central to general relativity. Um, and that's basically where you have a, um, a metric on your uh, coordinate system which you then project onto your curved space. I'm just going to rush through this because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. So you imagine a small, uh, a small uh, distance on your, uh, in your coordinate system here, and you imagine how, how big is that? So this would be um, in a polar coordinate system, d r squared plus r squared d theta squared. But of course, it's much less than that in the subjective experience. Um, so I've already mentioned length dilatation at a distance. So, and of course what I was just talking about was standing on a road, but, but that is actually in three dimensions of space. You know, if you were to, how I'm going to try and ex explain this is, if you were to ask at least a child, how far further are the stars from the moon in this, this picture, you'd say, well, a little bit further, okay? But of course, that, that's length dilatation because my little bit further here corresponds to thousands of light years in objective space. Okay, that's length dilatation with increasing distance. Okay, so Einstein, um, and the, the central conceptual leap for general relativity was this equivalence principle that if L there is in an elevator sitting on the surface of the Earth, and it, this isn't the window, he actually can't see out, then his experience is exactly the same as Bert, uh, who is uh, sitting in an elevator which is accelerated uh, at a constant acceleration through free space. Okay. So I'm going to now um, suggest to you that the same thing, not something very similar, um, is seen also in neuroscience. Now, you might think you've seen this before. This is a picture of vi left visual inattention. Left visual inattention is something that somebody who's had a cortical stroke affecting the parietal lobe, usually the non-dominant parietal lobe on the right side, experiences, where they do not attend to their left hemisphere. If you present them uh, with two stimuli at the same time, they will only point to the one in their right hemisphere, I'm talking about you, for example, um, and not in their left 
hemi field, but if you present it individually, they can still see it. Also, they, people with left visual attention have a distortion of their subjective space, so that they will tend to only look over to their right side. So what's the equivalence principle? Well, this, you might remember, is also, in terms of, the, of what you see without that nystagmus, it's also the same picture I showed you for left vestibular stimulation. And in general, people, it's acknowledged in neurology that you get the same distortion of space in vestibular stimulation or in a, a constant angular acceleration as you get in visual attention. There is an equivalence. In this case, we're talking about angular acceleration. Without the nystagmus, I should just point out, but in terms of the distortion of space. And um, the, so he is looking at this person with visual inattention from the top of the head. They, they are neglecting their, their left hemifield, and um, so we're taking the angles extending around here. Um, and they're tending to look over to the right side. To make it my, um, we're almost at the end here, but to, to try to make my, um, my point about curvature more intelligible, I'm going to pretend here that, that we actually have a screen, a curved screen, which extends around this subject at, at a radius of one meter. So that distances here along this screen correspond to that angle and radius. Now, what the, what the clinical neurologist will do for you, if you are unlucky enough ever to have a stroke and develop visual inattention, is draw a line across a piece of paper and ask you to put a mark where you think the center of that line is. And someone with, with visual inattention will put it over there. There's this distortion of their subjective space, so that they think that that's the middle. Very much like the distortion where they tend to be looking to where they think is the middle, which is over to the right side. So this is what I believe is, is a, a way of, of depicting this person's subjective space. In other words, it's curved, something like that. So that they're putting the mark in what is the middle of their subjective space. But what we do is we impose a flat space coordinate system on that, something like that, which to us, the neurologist, looks like they've misplaced their central point. And similarly, you could, this was just a, um, depicting just that little bit of where you're drawing the line, but you could do the same thing for the entire visual field which we've mapped with that screen there. And um, this is really just so you can see the correspondence with what I showed you about the artist's perspective and the road. You can imagine here that way over to the right side of the visual field, a small displacement X will cause a bigger displacement in, the, in this subjective space, something like that. Um, whereas way over on the other side, you will get the, basically about the same displacement in uh, subjective space as you do in the body. Okay. Um, and interestingly, again, not, um, not described in the relativistic terms, the opposite's been found for time. So if you get people to, uh, to estimate the duration of a stimulus, call that a one-second stimulus, uh, over here in the, in, in the uh, hemifield that they're attending to, they will actually say it took less than a second, whereas they will say it took about a second out here. Okay, so last slide. Sorry, I've gone over time already. Um, so in, instead of looking at this diagram from the front with sort of two sheets of paper, we're going to look from the side here. Um, it would look something like this, okay? And what I'm going to suggest to you is you might have seen something like that before, okay? Perhaps it looks something like this. This is an embedding diagram from what happened to the distortion of space around a black hole. It's what's called the Schwarzschild metric. Some of you might have heard of it. That's the formula. But the bottom line is, you get this same uh, length contraction as you approach the black hole, the time dilation, as opposed to way out here, away from the black hole. 
where, uh, where basically you've got a one-to-one -one correspondence. So just as uh, this term here in the formula corresponds to this gravitational potential, I'm going to suggest that, that there is something like an, uh, an attentional potential where I here, rather than being mass, is some sort of information theoretic measure. We've got information because the person with, uh, with inattention is nearly certain that everything's going to happen over to their right side. Um, uh, so, basically, uh, this is just, we talked about blue sky research, this is about as blue as the sky gets in neuroscience research. Um, but uh, there's a formula uh, for you of what I think might describe uh, the curvature of, of experience. So, attention uh, is the uh, curvature of subjective space-time by information. So, thank you, and sorry for going over time. I didn't think I was going to get my mind blown today, but uh, what, what a way to start. Fantastic. Um, uh, let's take a, just a couple of quick questions before we massage our, our stomachs with cake. Any, any questions? Okay, well, one back there. I'm suggesting a very general formula that would occur to the simple situation and to the com and to the complex. So I think the maths would be the same. I guess what, what I find interesting about the complex situation is why it seems still to be ordered in some way, at least in terms of things which are objectively of common onset and offset, still seeming to have common onset and offset, even though there seems to be according to neuroscientific literature, uh, there should be dilation and contraction of various stimuli depending on how uh, predictable or unpredictable they are. But that's the thing which, which I find interesting. Um, so I, I, I'm sure that doesn't answer your question. Uh, just, just one more question yeah, over here. Look, there's all sorts of different ways that people have tried to uh, to explain these these um, subjective distortions of time. So, for example, this this idea of um, kind of unpredictable stimuli seeming to last longer. Um, the idea then is that by something being unpredictable, somehow it changes the rate of your clock. But it would then have to change the rate locally in some areas and not in other areas. And uh, look, I guess one of the reasons I've got into this is that these kind of explanations, they become more and more difficult the, the, you know, the more you try and apply them to real world situations. So, I, I, you know, I guess you're, what you're suggesting about there being a fundamental clock which is working for everything, that's probably what somebody in the 19th century would have said about how physics worked, right? that there's just, we all share the same clock, whether we're moving, or whether there's mass, or whatever. And Einstein's theory just threw that all out. And uh, no, maybe you're right, maybe that that's all we need, just the classical stuff to explain um, subjective space and time, but I doubt it. Thank you. Yeah, I've, yeah, another thing is, is you know, in, in physics we have no problem in thinking, well, the maths is true for everything. We believe that maths, if we, if we, if we develop maths for one area, we can transplant that and it, it, it applies in other areas. What, why not areas like this? Um, in thanking each uh, speaker today, I tried to get a book that reflects their, their title, and this one is called At the Edge of Uncertainty. So, thank you, Matt.